Hello, everybody, and welcome to another uh, lockdown session. This one isn't live. This one is uh, kind of a pre-recorded, but it's unedited. And um, I wanted to do a couple of sessions with some staff members um, so that when you come back to golf, that you kind of know what to expect in different areas of the, of the business. Obviously, one of the big areas of the business for all of you guys, all the members, is to when you arrive at the club is that you go into the into the pro shop and you are met by either David, Jared or Priyanka. Um, and the club's front of house, kind of head professional, but definitely head fitter, custom club fitter, is David Bunker. David, how are you? I'm all right, thanks, Dunk, to you. Ah, you're in the studio, good. Uh, I am. I've been That's very good. So um, I must admit, David, I'm going to tell a little story about when I came back to Moor Park. Um, obviously, came back. You were really welcoming. Um, you, sh you showed me around. and We saw the room that used to be the junior room, which is what you're in now. Um, and we spoke a bit about technology and everything else. And, you know, I've been very fortunate in my career to have met a lot of people that are custom club fitters that specialize in fitting drivers, fairways, hybrids, irons, wedges, putters, you know, all the way through the bag, which you do. But I was very wary at the start because I thought, well, is he any good? Um, I've been very fortunate to know people that have fit, you know, Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy, John Rahm, now, now Tommy Fleetwood. Obviously, I know Jason McNiven at Golf Principles, yeah. Dominic Griffiths, who works for Ping on Tour. Um, and obviously A.D. Reitfeld, who's with Taylor May. And I have to say, when I had a fitting with you and I got my Callaway irons and my Taylor May driver, I have to say that your expertise, your knowledge, um, your understanding and very sympathetic ear to, to my needs, wants and, wants and needs, was just superb. You know, those boys that I've just mentioned are probably dealing with the 0.1% of golfers, sure. um, you know, the elite, elite, elite. And you get to deal with a really broad spectrum of, of golfers. And I just thought, like I said, your knowledge, your understanding, your manner uh, was just exceptional. You know, I was, I was pretty much set on Mizuno's and you just went click, click, build, build, hit one of these. As soon as I hit it in the air, I said, these are them. And, you know, the results speak for themselves, even though I think I've used them three times. But <laughs> I look forward to using them when we get back. So how did you end up in custom fitting and how did you end up at Moore Park? I suppose fitting is something that I sort of stumbled into a little bit. Um, been a PGA pro now for this will be my 16th year. So I spent a long time, uh, almost a decade at Stanmore Golf Club. So not too far from here. Uh, did a lot of teaching, played a little bit as well. Um, and, and fitting back then, I would say even five, six years ago, wasn't what it is today. I think a lot of fitting was quite basic, uh, quite, quite very much based upon just measurements of the individual. Whereas now with launch monitors, it's so much more based upon the ball flight and, and what the club is doing to the ball. So through that time, I spent a lot of my time watching demo days. You know, we would host brands that would come, come on site, Callaway, Cobra, TaylorMade, Ping, et cetera, and just watch these guys who to me looked like magicians just making things happen to the golf ball by by changing the club in the individual players hands whether it be a, a 28 handicapper or a scratch black so i was fascinated to be honest um and i took my own equipment quite seriously so i was back and forth from st ives up in cambridge to the Titleist fitting center their national fitting center uh fortunate that one of the Titleist reps at the time paul wharton was quite helpful with my golf when I was playing. So he would, he would help me out with some tight list kit. So got very keen into the golf clubs. And I would say even now 
I am still that kid in the pro shop. When a new club comes in, I will pick it up, put it in my hands and think, oh, that looks like a really nice drive. I'd, I'd like to give that a hit and see what it can do. So my, my love for golf equipment has always been there through my junior years, my professional career. Um, and then it was, it was fate, really, where I'd known the guys at Complete Golfer from my junior days where I was a member at Northwood. So I've known Lawrence and the guys more than 20, 25 years, maybe. And um, yeah, I, I was back and forth from his shop when I was at Stanmore. We, we were lucky to have an arrangement where we could supply our members with, with golf clubs because we couldn't open as many accounts as they had with all the equipment brands. So I was in and out with drivers and sets of irons for my members doing some fitting. And Lawrence called me aside one day and I thought, here we go. This is, he's, he's saying you're in here too much. <laughs> what, what do you think you're playing at? And it, it wasn't that at all. We, we got chatting and there was, a, there was a role at Moore Park, which was to, to manage the golf shop for him, um, which most of the members will appreciate, complete golf for our staffing and stocking and, and running the pro shop here at Moore Park. So, and, and the role included custom fitting. And I thought, great, this would be an opportunity for me to put my skills and my knowledge and, and all the things I've witnessed and learned over that time in, into fruition, really. Um, so, yeah, it, it wasn't a teaching role at the time. So I knew exactly where, you know, where my, my skill set would be as I, as I came to Moore Park almost four and a half years ago. Okay, so who who was the shop was obviously where 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 it was um, because when I when I was here when I was an assistant the first time around we were in the orangery right. and Lawrence it was Lawrence Bailey and John Rule at the time yes. um, that took the shop over and then I left in two thousand and one and the November of two thousand and one the shop actually went into its current location from the orangery. Um, so what was the setup when you came in? So what, what was your role then and what's your role kind of now? How, how do you see that? I would say to start with, obviously the studio which I'm sat in was here already. So that there was golf clubs in here, there were shafts, heads for, for all the brands that we fit for. Um, the diary for fitting was probably not, <laughs> not what it is now it, it, <laughs> it's incredibly busy which you know mm. um even through the lockdown we have inquiries about you know when are you coming back when are you fitting so the past week myself and jared have just been just returning phone calls and trying to come up with a schedule for the return golf so the the diary wasn't as busy my role was to manage the shop for the benefit of the members obviously we would take green fees for, for guests um stock all sorts of things as, as you do in a pro shop from Mars bars all the way to electric trolleys. Um, we're, we're that first port, port of call for most of the members. So any questions we're, we're on hand. Um, and it, it is that first, yeah, it's that first port of call in the journey at the golf club. When you get out your car, you, you often report to the shop or pop your head in, go past to get your clubs or your shoes from the locker room. Um, so it was very, very much face on with the members, which I like. I like to, interact with the members talk about all sorts of things so it's it's not just custom fitting it could be how their game was did they watch the football the night before so I think yeah this past three four four years we've we've really developed a good relationship with the members where I hope I, I, I at least hope they feel they can come and talk to us and just come and say hi generally I mean for me you know you you mentioned about how how much busier the the diary has got the fitting diary has got and I think that just shows how good yourself and Jared are at, at fitting is because people are, are now trusting you with, with which can be a very expensive outlay, yep. of, outlay of money. Um, what kind of happens, how, how do people book, in, book a session in and then what happens in a session? I know you're going to kind of take us through what would happen in a session, but how, how does it all work? Because I know there's... There's three of you in the shop. It's you, Jared, and Priyanka, and that's that, that's our, you can that's reopen our, the shop team. on the 12th of April. That's how it's going to look, right? Yeah, that's our current team. So I would do the majority of the custom fitting. Jared would do some as well. Um, Priyanka's started her PGA journey, so 
she will at some stage be conducting fittings because part of her course would be to understand the ins and outs of custom fitting in order to pass her, her PGA badges. So yeah, it, it's the, 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 first, the first thing that often happens is somebody will pop their head into us in the shop or it'll be at the complete golfer or it may be over the phone just inquiring about I'm, I'm looking at some golf clubs or I hear there's a new driver I'm interested in, in, in testing it effectively, having a go with it. So it, it's, much, it's much more about performance now, I think. And I think that's where we've got quite busy is we're quite honest. Um, take, take you, for example, when we booked your fitting, you, you were adamant I wasn't going to touch your three wood. <laughs> <laughs> Still got a three wood. <laughs> How old? <laughs> 2007. Yeah. So. Yeah. Like Henry Stenson. It's like Trigger's new bro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's a club clearly that you're quite attached to. And I, I had no ambition of changing that. You know, you're, you're quite wedded to that golf club in your bag. So it, fitting now for us is not a, it's not a selling exercise. It is a performance exercise. And often, Jared and I like to say, look, the numbers do the talking. If, if that golf ball is performing better in the way you want it to, often you're, you're at a, a decision, aren't you? Do I, do I invest in this, this piece of equipment that's going to ultimately improve my handicap, make my enjoyment level increase for, for the game that you love? So, yeah, it, it's more of a, a performance experience more so now, especially with launch monitors. So, yeah, one, once that inquiry comes in, we would have a brief chat, you know, understand what the player's needs are, what the handicap is. Are you having any golf lessons? Have you discussed this with your coach? What are you looking at? Is it a full set? Is it just a set of irons or a, a driver? And, and ultimately kind of find out what they need before we step in the room. So, you know, we're not spending too much time briefing each other on what brands we can start with. This is all done before we step in the room. Okay, and then, you know, I've obviously, I've directed people to you. Yes. Um, because of some of the equipment that they've turned up for, for lessons, <laughs> for lessons with. Um, so do you encourage people to bring, if they have their own equipment, do you encourage them to, to bring their current golf clubs or do you prefer them turning up what I would call blind? I would always prefer them to bring their own golf equipment because ultimately you're doing a comparison, aren't you? You're, you're looking at, here's my existing seven iron, which you did. You, you hit your seven iron. We're looking at what the performance is of it. And then I'll ask you, what do you want to see the ball do differently? Is it to go further? Is it to, to improve the accuracy? Are you looking for more consistency of the distance that you hit it? So it's not too long or short. Um, does it need to feel better, look better? There's so many wants and needs. And once you establish what that player wants, I then ultimately will put something in your hands that you hit and hopefully ticks that box. And then we're left with a, a two, two kind of sets of data on the screen, a before and after, if you like. This is where you were when you walked in. This is where we got to. Sometimes it's a big difference and a big improvement and the player's kind of like, wow, that's great. Sometimes it isn't, you know, on the rare occasions we don't see an improvement, but that's where Jared and I will turn to the player and say, look, you are better staying with what you have for the moment, but you are always welcome back anytime if you want to try out stuff next year when there's new models next year or just come back whenever. If It doesn't have to be a, a selling exercise. It's for you to see a, a, an improvement that warrants you investing in that set of clubs or that driver. Okay. So let's say um let's say we're we're, we're going with a uh, a set of irons sure uh, is that the numbers you got up on the is that a, yeah is so that <laughs> an example up on the board i had a, i had a brief hit with uh with a seven iron i had three three hits with a seven iron so if i uh get some numbers up for you this is probably where i need to get out of the way for you Is that clear enough, Duncan? Yeah, so I can see on the left-hand side, it says 114.1. I presume that's ball speed? Ball speed, so simply how fast is that ball travelling off the club face? Yeah. 
the next one is 19.6. Yeah, which is the launch angle. So what angle is that ball taking off at? And this is where we're starting to look for optimum, uh, a window of launch. So for me at my club head speed, somewhere between 18 and 20 degrees. I'm quite happy with that. Okay. And that will change dependent on the player's ball speed, stroke club head speed, yeah? It, it certainly would, yeah. So if you imagine slower swings often won't hit the ball particularly high so the type of model we put in their hands would would help them achieve you know that 20 22 degree launch launch window somebody of Rory McIlroy's club head speed who will deliver more compression more shaft lean from a technical standpoint will maybe launch it a bit lower than that so every, every case is individual so we're not just kind of fitting by numbers we're, we're dealing with the individual in front of us and trying to to improve, I mean, some players will have a preference. They might want to hit it lower or higher. So we will work with what those, those players are trying to achieve. Okay. And the next number, the 6,100 and, and is that 81? 81. Uh, backspin. That's right, I presume. That's the backspin. So that's how many revolutions we, we've got on that um, in terms of RPM. So for me, somewhere between six and 7,000, I'm quite happy with. Often there's products that will spin or shafts that will create lower or higher spin rates. So if we do find we've got a player in a, in a situation where their, their, their launch and spin are completely out of whack, that's where the, the room comes into its own. All of these shafts and heads, which I tend to refer to as our ingredients, mm -hmm. we're, we're just trying to, to come out with the best recipe to, to make the dish as sweet as possible. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. And then... So if we've got a higher launch, so if we've got a slower swing speed, stroke ball speed, sure, we've got a higher launch for a seven iron. Will that yeah. produce the same spin rate, or are we looking always between six and seven? Or if we're launching it a bit higher because we swing it a bit slower, do we want to increase the spin as well, or is that not is that not quite right? So. These numbers are my numbers, so I'm, I've got the benefit of hitting my seven iron, which is fitted. So mm -hmm. these, these numbers are quite, I'm quite happy with. The, the, the example I would give is, you know, it, it, it all depends on what that golf ball needs to do. So if the player just wants to increase distance, and that is their sole goal, we, we would actually lower the backspin, and that ball will travel further forwards as opposed to up. Yeah provided they launch it high enough to keep it in the air. So another player with a higher club head speed will look to stop, the, stop that seven iron on a sixpence on the green. So we, want, we might need to increase the backspin. Um, so, you know, the, the better the player, the longer they hit it, often they're looking for precision. So increasing the spin will help them stop that ball on the green. Slower club head speed player that just wants to hit it and make up the distance will often lower that spin. So that's where... There are so many heads and so many shafts because they all do different things to the ball. And the player's job is just to be the player and hit it and, and, and let the club kind of lead them in the right direction, hopefully with Jared and I lead it, leading them there. Yeah. 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 And then the, the next one, I think, is that side angle? Side angle. So just where the golf ball starts, very similar probably to the track man that you use. Is, is it starting left or right of of the center line, so center zero. So I've started this ball negative 0.7. So that's just starting slightly left of target, but that's me because I like to hit slight fade. So I'm quite happy with that. Yeah. And then you've got, is that carry distance and total? Correct, yeah. And that's, that's the average of the three shots I've hit. So we're in a fitting, we're always working on an average. It's not a case of, I want somebody to just hit one perfect shot and sell them a set of clubs. I'm looking for them to hit five or six with that seven iron, see what it does on average and, and see how ultimately consistent that club is. So the, the three shots I've hit, you can kind of see my spin numbers are quite consistent. My launch is quite consistent. They're not too, too kind of varied. The standard deviation isn't hopefully too high. Uh, I wouldn't want to see launches up and down, spins up and down because there's something going on there that's, that's inconsistent. So if we, for example, I don't, well, that's not true. Uh, the, what setup do you have in your clubs? And although I'm going to use the phrase, I'm going to back it up straight afterwards. So from standard, yes, one, 
<laughs> from standards, what is your setup? And then how do different ingredients alter that spin rate, launch angles, and you know, and, and bits and pieces? Because for me, who literally teaches flat out non-stop, this side of golf instruction really 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 you know i i'm very interested in it um that's why i always bombard you with a load of questions if there's a new shaft a new head that comes out a new grip there's you know i always ask you what does that do to the ball what's that going to do to the what's that what would that do for me and then you always come back with just you know great answers so although there is no set standard which I kind of wish there was. Um, how is your how are your clubs set up? And then um, how do if we change the lie or the loft or the weight of the shaft, length of the shaft, how does that affect everything? And I know that's a massively broad question. Yeah, I think for example, this season I'm going to be using that's new Callaway Apex Pro. Well, oh, you've changed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what I've ended up with in that seven iron isn't the seven iron that you would see on the shelf in in the complete golf or in our shop at Moore Park. So, the, the sets you see on the shelf are effectively what I would call a wallpaper set. They're just for looking at. They're for you to look at the the design, the type of profile of club and thing. I quite like the look of those. Have a chat with us in the shop. Do you think these will suit me? Do you think these will help me? That will often lead to the fitting. So. From standard, or well, like you say, there isn't really a standard. Every manufacturer has a different standard, which just adds to the confusion. So, you know, we have to be really on the ball. Some, some manufacturers will be a bit longer or shorter in their lengths, a bit more flat or upright in their lie angle. So for me, I've used Callaway for four or five years. I would say the simplest way of doing it is my clubs are longer. So I'm 6'2". Most of the standard-ish sets, let's say, are based upon somebody that's about 5'10 to 6 feet tall. So in terms of a male golfer, so my clubs are half an inch longer and, and the lie angle is bent more upright to basically help me set up to the balls as comfortably and naturally as I want to and deliver that, that club head on the back of the ball as efficiently and as optimal as possible. So uh, do you want me to explain a bit about lie angle so we don't... Yeah, because I know how much it can affect what the ball, how the ball flies. So, so yeah, so I'm, I'm looking to deliver that club flat to the ground at impact. So often we're looking at lie angle, what I would call dynamically. So I want to see that club at impact, the dynamic delivery as flush to the ground as possible to stabilise the flight. I don't want to see the, the club particularly toe down or heel down because that will cause some disruption of the, the turf interaction and could lose the ball off target. So we're looking for the lie angle to, to help control that. Some, some players will have a tendency to miss left and right. So we can use a bit of lie angle to give them a bias, protect them a little bit. So I like to fade the ball. I don't like to miss the ball to the, to the left. So my clubs are, albeit upright, they're not as upright as they should be for me. They are just, slightly so that I get the correct delivery, but still with some fade bias in my flight. Same would be if a player wanted some draw bias, we can, we can work with that. And the length is just to suit my height. The, the goal is always to fit generally the club as long as possible to somebody for distance. You know, we want to make that club long in length. The long lever creates more speed. But if we go too long, we will compromise the ability to hit the sweet spot. So for me, I've tested half an inch, three quarters of an inch, an inch longer. And, and when I go above that half inch longer, I, I lose my strike. I can't deliver the sweet spot. So albeit that club is longer and should deliver more power, it, it becomes ineffective because I just can't hit, hit the ball cleanly. So half an inch is my kind of limit. I can hit the sweet spot. It gives me the correct setup for my height and I feel comfortable with that. Can that go the other way then? So if a club, let's say you used a club that was an inch shorter than standard sure. so effectively an inch and a half shorter than your golf clubs would that affect the quality of strike as well i think well if you think about a pitching wedge for example yeah 
my, my pitching wedge could be the same length as somebody's seven iron if they were five foot six. So strike maybe would be, for me, I would catch the, the middle of the golf ball, thin it mm -hmm. or top it, because mm -hmm. my posture would be affected. Um, but the same would apply, you know, if I did get somebody coming of a certain height and, and a standard length wasn't suitable, we can go the other way. We have shafts that are shorter. So ultimately you're fitting the length to their ability to, to hit the sweet spot consistently. I don't want to make the club long so that one in 10 come out the sweet spot and go maximum distance. We need to see that as much as, you know, as often as possible. And I think that's why, you know, when it's in the news at the moment about Bryson, hitting yeah. the ball so far and everything else, him experimenting with a 48-inch driver, which is two inches longer than standard. Two, yeah, two and a half inches longer, yeah. Um, but he said he wasn't making extra gains because he couldn't strike it out the middle. He couldn't control the sweet spot. So I'm unaware how long his driver actually is, but, it, but because of the speed that he swings it, He's having to go back to what we were doing originally with the seven iron. He's had to reduce the amount of loft on the on the club head, otherwise it would launch too high and spin too much. Is that correct? Yeah. So that that his club has been, he's going to put an awful lot of friction on the back of the ball. So there's going to be a lot of backspin. Hence, he's using four or five degrees of loft, for example. Um, and what fascinates me is you've got somebody like Dustin Johnson who's using around about 12 degrees of loft. So that will confuse a lot of players, but ultimately the loft is down to how that player is delivering the golf ball. Uh, are they attacking it a certain way? Are they spinning it a certain way? And that is why there are so many driver heads within a certain model. So I, I've only tested the irons at this point. I will be looking at some drivers for myself this year. And I, I will test all the lofts, nine degrees, mm. all the way to 12 to find that, that sweet spot. And I, I suppose with fitting, it's kind of the, the Goldilocks scenario with the porridge. You're, you're looking for what's just right. It, it's not too hot, not too cold, just right. I'm looking for across the board, the numbers that are going to give me the best chance of hitting consistent shots, whether it be long enough, straight enough, feel right, look right in terms of ball flight. So th there are so many combinations. I think D Dustin at the Masters was using 12 degrees, which will blow people's minds surely at his club of speed he should be using eight seven Rory's in sort of nine territory I think Tiger's around uh ten and a half when he's when he's played um so every player has something different but ultimately you're trying to get those guys delivering similar numbers but using different ingredients to get there so then loft is obviously a major ingredient Yes, because it's going to affect how high that ball takes off of the club base. Um, some, some element of spin will be, be included in that. And then uh, length of shaft is more centeredness of strike? Yeah, it, it's fine. Well, posture as well, if you've got somebody that's in, you know, particularly tall, we, we don't want them to feel that they're, they're stooping over too much like, like I would with a standard club. So it's, it's creating comfort. Uh, from a static setup perspective, but ultimately, yes, centerness of strike. Um, then, what about uh, weight of shaft? Yes, yeah, so a shaft is probably the, the biggest minefield for the customer, if you like, yeah. uh, because there are so many. And, and when you come in for a fitting, um, you know, the, the walls around me are just filled with shafts. So, mm. if you've never had a fitting, that can look intimidating. Some players will come in here thinking I'm going to put them through their paces and we need to hit every single one. <laughs> but very, very quickly, that player is hitting the ball. I'm looking at the numbers as they're hitting and I'm sifting through all the options already. I'm, I'm dis discarding a massive percentage of those shafts because they just won't suit from a weight perspective, a flex perspective, whether they're going to affect the height of the ball, the spin of the ball. So, yeah, weight of shaft, again, it's that, it's that Goldilocks thing. You, you can give a player a club that's too light or too heavy. It just doesn't work. Their tempo's thrown out. If it's too heavy, they become tired. So often we, you know, with our fitting, it's trying to relay it back to real world and say to somebody, look, you're playing 18 holes of golf. You're walking four and a half miles. You're hitting the ball X amount of times. 
where are you losing that that good score? And often players are saying, I'm struggling up the back nine the last few holes. If we can give you a club that is easier to hit, is lighter, and you, you've got gas in the tank to hit those five irons, those hybrids, those last few tee shots, you're hopefully going to get that good score over the line and not feel like, oh, I'm dreading hitting that next five iron, you know? Yeah. And then, I mean, that's, that, that kind of just leads me straight into flex of shaft. Yeah. Now, yeah. again, I know there's no standard with regards <laughs> to flex as well. So, you know, with me, with the li very limited custom fitting that I have done, I'm usually okay with regards to, I can get people in the ballpark, but it's the fine tuning. Yeah. Which your, where, where you and Jared and your, your, your expertise really shines through is if someone comes into a fitting or with a, like a, preconceived idea that I swing the golf club at with a driver at 95 miles an hour so I need a stiff shaft now 10 years ago 15 years ago I'd probably just go yes but now that isn't the case correct or pretty much yeah so it, it's it's where you know selling a, a golf club or set of clubs off the shelf is happening far less because there are so many options in shaft. So we, we need to really see that player hit the golf ball before we can make a, a, a solid decision. Because if we just say, well, you're, you're a standard stiff, that's fine, it, it may work. Um, you, you could come for that fitting an hour of your time and still end up in that standard shaft, but at least we've gone through the exercise to, to prove that that works. Um, I know at the moment, Louis Oosthuizen is, is using the new ping driver that's going to come out and he's actually using their off the shelf stock shaft, believe it or not, which for a tour player is almost unheard of. But he will have gone through the process with one of the guys that on the, you know, on the ping truck and determined that actually, do you know what, Louis, that shaft is performing great. He obviously likes the way it feels. The ball flight's doing what he wants. So it's, it's happy days. That, that can still happen with a, with a fitting with us at an amateur level. So I, I suppose with Shaft, it's just being open-minded. I think that's the thing we try, the message we try and say to all players, you know, look what's out there, look what heads are out there, what brands, what type of shafts you think you need. But ultimately, you know, turn up a bit open-minded because we will surprise you, I think, and that's what almost happened with you a bit with your, with your fitting. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I know I was, I think... One of the clubs I tried was 120 grams. And yes. Then we, and then we went all the way down to, was it the 85 in the Catalyst? It was an 85 in, if you don't mind me saying, a graphite shaft in, in oh. a set of lines, which would, would almost scare, you know, cert, certain players who, who will have a, an ego of, you know, I'm, I'm strong enough, I hit the ball far enough, I need heavy and I need extra stiff. But... There, there are so many different ways that we can get the result. And, and graphite has become just as stiff as steel, just as stable as steel. Now the technology of shafts is phenomenal. We can actually go the other way and give you steel that's 80 grams. And that never used to be possible. You, you'd be in the 120, 130 gram territory. So the, the spectrum of shafts, yes, it's a minefield. That's where Jared and I come into our own because we do a lot of research. We do a lot of online uh, certifications with the brands of shafts, True Temper, um, KBS, all, all of the shaft companies will do a certification which we will, we will do and pass so that we understand exactly what a shaft does to a ball, what type of player that will fit. So it, it, it's a difficult one often where you get a player on the what I call the border. They're between flex in their head. Oh, I, I should be in a stiff, but maybe I'm swinging at a regular pace. There's regulars that will play just as stiff as a stiff, and there's stiffs that will play just as soft as a regular. So, it, again, it is a case of trialing a few. We don't often get a fitting where somebody walks in, the first club we give them works. You know, it is a process of trying to ease them into that finale, that, that wow moment where they hit one like you had, and it's mm. the ball's just hit the, the screen almost. It's hit the net. And you turn to me and that ball's still simulated in the air and you're saying, it's these ones, Dave. Because you just kind of know after you've hit a shot, we all know when we've hit that shot. And I'm sure we've all got clubs in our bags that, like you with that three wood, 
you don't want to let go because it just feels right. You trust it. And it's a trusted old friend that you, you can rely upon on the golf course. Yeah. And then, but for, for me, with regards to um, golf clubs that we see the guys, you mentioned Louis with regards to his ping and it's kind of straight off the shelf. Can I get the same golf club? Can I get the same driver as Rory? Because years ago, when I was an assistant, no chance. And no. it was always the talk, whether it be an assistant pro or an elite amateur, was I've got one off the tour because it yeah. was a slightly different shaped head or it was a completely different shaft. They had bands on them. They had serial numbers. And you, you definitely, you know, you definitely couldn't give them away and all this sort of stuff. Um, how has, has that changed? Yeah, it, it's where the, the simple answer is yes. You, the, the, the tailor-made driver that Rory McIlroy is going to be using 2021 is the exact head that we will be fitting with mm -hmm. and ultimately selling to the customer. So there is no difference now. There, there used to be, but there is now zero difference. There, I mean, say zero difference. They, they might ask for a certain preference. It could be the weight of it. But those guys are dealing at a level where it's they're very picky and they know what they like so even the shafts now the shafts that we fit with are the shafts the real deal shafts that the likes of rory will be using um the grips are the same so all of the component of that golf club now is is like for like and i think that's what i i think has made fitting kind of explode a bit it, it's gone a bit nuts because people are really excited about you know what? i can use what those guys are using and and like you were saying that never used to be the case so you, you have to kind of take your hat off to the manufacturers that they're able to do that yeah and then is that and that's all the way through the bag so with regards to i know i now know i can get a driver that as long as i turn up with no preconceived ideas or i'm i'm open-minded i'm going to get a driver that i can deliver more repetitively, more optimally. But what happens if I've turned up for a lesson with me and you're a 23 handicapper and it's dunk, so I want to get down to 16 by the end of the year. I'm going to invest in lessons and change and uh, a, a new set of golf clubs. But I'm worried that when my swing changes, I'm going to now have to buy another set of golf clubs. Oh, sure. Um, I get asked that quite a lot, and I'm sure I'm sure you do as well. <laughs> we do as well. I think to, you will you'll know probably more than me is that to make wholesale changes in your golf swing don't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. They will, they will take some time, require practice. So to move the dial often will take quite a long period of time, and it, it's incremental. So. I think in a fitting, obviously, we get a short glimpse at what that player can do. We're asking them what their journey is. Where are you going with your game? And it's trying to assist them to get there. Because if they've got the wrong tools when they turn up for that lesson with you, your job is harder. Their practice becomes hard work. So if we've got a tool that can assist and, and be part of that journey, great. I think with things like lie angle, length, very rarely that would change because that, that's a measurement of that player's body and how they're delivering the club. Often I, I find in golf lessons, players are changing ultimately the route the club is taking to the golf ball, as opposed to maybe the destination of, of that dynamic lie angle or length. You know, unless a player specifically is lifting the handle considerably wrong. But yeah, ultimately you're changing the route you're taking to the golf ball. Often players will slice so they'll be working on changing their path. Some players will be slightly too steep and you'll be shallowing out their angle of attack, but they'll be delivering their body, their posture ultimately fairly close. So things like that won't change. And if, if they do see a change, they, will, they may come back and, and we'll look at refitting them. And if it means they have to part X that set and, and we'll, we do a deal and we, we then invest in the new set, we'll do it. Um, I don't see people come back that, that quickly, to be honest, because I, those changes don't happen overnight. And then we, we, the biggest things that I see change or the clubs that get changed on tour most often are the wedges. Yes. Now, 
<laughs> you and I both know that wedge fitting is probably the strangest. Uh, putting's probably pretty close, but wedge fit wedge fitting compared to doing a set of irons, doing hybrids, fairways, and drivers is there's definitely no hard and fast rule with regards to to fitting wedges. Um, what's your take on how do how do you prefer to do a wedge fit? So I will start with the player in the studio and I would ask them to bring their, their, their set of irons. And I want to see what pitching wedge they have. So we get them to hit the pitching wedge and then we're discussing what additional wedges do we have? Do we have a gap, a sand, a lob, uh, or simply just a sand wedge? So the reason we do it this way is I want to see how far that pitching wedge goes. So we took you, for example, the pitching wedge you play is 45 degrees, give or take. And you might hit that pitching wedge 125 yards through the air. That next club will have to go a certain distance and the wedge below it and the wedge below it. So we'll figure out that pitching wedge distance. I'll ask you what the maximum loft you want to play. So you might tell me I want to play 60 degrees. Well, let's start with 60. We'll get a 60 degree distance and we've got a pitching wedge distance. Now that might give me 45 yards of, of a gap. And that's too big a gap really just to put a single wedge in the middle. So we might need to put two wedges in there and space out, you know, 10, 12, 15 yards per wedge. So we start with the long game perspective because you are going to hit these clubs an awful lot. About 45% of your game as a golfer is going to be from 50 yards and in, roughly. Yeah. So those, yeah. those wedges are your scoring clubs. Yeah. Um, so we want to know how far you can hit the maximum. And then it's a case of going out onto, and we're very fortunate here with the short game facility we've got onto the chipping area. So I want to test those wedges out from a chipping perspective. Can you play them out of bunkers? Is there a specific club you would use from the bunker? And how that player interacts with the turf is going to determine what, and this, this is the big, the big one, is what bounce and grind does the golfer play? And that's where players start to go, well, Dave, that's, that's over my head. I don't... <laughs> I don't know. I just want a 56 degree. Here's one on the shelf. And I'm very quick to say it's not as simple as that. I need to see you at golf ball because there are, I think, tight lists with the Vokey range do around 25 to 30 combinations. So, yeah, it, it's start off with the long game, get your distances worked out. And then I want to see those wedges out on the pitching area, pitching from the rough, from bunkers to figure out the bounces and the grinds. And we often do that blind, but I might have, with you, I might have you chipping with a 54 degree sand wedge and say, I've got three of them, just hit them and see what you feel and see what you see. And you'll know the one that interacts with the turf the cleanest and feels the sweetest and spins the right way and you, you feel most confident with. And that's often the grind or the bounce that, that suits you rather than tell you, oh, this is 10 degrees of bounce and this is a, a C grind or an S grind. Just, just play the shot dunk and we'll figure out very quickly a process of elimination. And then with different ground conditions or bunker conditions, sand yeah. conditions, um, how, how difficult is it to, let's say, to fit a set of wedges for someone, a, a member of Moore Park who let's say at the weekend, then goes and plays Lynx golf. It's, it's difficult when you look at the tour players and, and they're very fortunate in this regard that they will carry, you know, in the garage at home, they'll have three, four sets of wedges. Now they may all have the same loft on, but they will have different bounces and grinds for going from St. Andrews one week to Thailand the next. You've got completely different grass types. Uh, you've got different textures. You've got different shots that you're going to need to play it is challenging and I think if a player has a very specific way of pitching and chipping and playing bunkers they're particularly steep or they pick it very clean that kind of leads you down a, a specific route majority of the time you, you're fitting very much middle of the road because we're all aware in this country I mean we can have brown fairways one summer and you know, the bone dry, no grass, and then you can be playing and it's quite lush, it's quite damp. So I suppose 
it's it's finding something that will tick enough boxes again. It's trying to give you enough of a, a helping hand to be able to play shots high, low, from wet sand, dry sand. But that, again, is where some practice and some coaching, some of the short game masterclasses it is where you can tell it you've got this wedge. The, the condition here, the lie is, is X. You're going to need to change your ball position, your club face position, or play the shot slightly differently. So we, we try to fit quite broadly so that that player can use those wedges all year round. And then is lie angle almost more important in the wedges than, than irons? Often we're trying to blend those with the iron set. Often the shafts can match up. So rather than just play the, the standard wedge flex, I would say 50% of the time we would play wedge flex. Mm -hmm. It's quite a nice soft feeling shaft. So for pitching and chipping, it's great. Um, it's very difficult when you've got somebody that hits the ball quite a long way and they need mm -hmm. quite stiff shafts in their irons. You start putting that in a sand wedge, it, it feels particularly horrible because you're not hitting the ball that hard. You're finessing the shot. Mm -hmm. So the, the shaft can play quite a big role. The lie angle, yes, we try and match up. If anything, we would maybe be slightly flatter in the in the wedges than the in the irons, just to help with keeping the the shot, you know, being struck a certain way, keeping loft and spin a certain way, and, and that's that's quite common on tour level as well. Excellent, and then that kind of leads me then into putting fitting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> again, another another minefield because. Um, actually, one of the one of the questions I will put to um, someone else that I'm going to interview with regards to to putting fitting, I'm, I'm right in saying that the shape of the putter and the way that the putter, you know, they can toe hang or face balanced or whatever it is. Um, one of the biggest myths or misconceptions was if you were a very arky stroke guy or girl or player or whatever it is that you should have a toe hang or face balance putter. And that's just simply not, simply not true. It's, to say it's simply not true is probably going a bit too far the other way. I, I, I probably sit more in your camp with it. I think you, you've got to see the player in front of you and how they putt. Hmm. And as much as fitting, you know, long game fitting, wedge fitting, there's a lot of science involved. There's a lot of launch data we're using expensive launch monitors. We're using the latest shaft and head technology. So there's, there's a lot of physics involved with that. And, and yes, there is with putting to some degree, but I've always found putting is an art. It's, it, you, you're more of a scientist when you're looking at long game, more of the artist on the green, green reading, seeing the line, being able to start the ball on that line. And I think you've got to like what you're looking at with a putter. You've got to feel confident setting it up. So. I spent some time, uh, I think it was 2020, with uh, one of the guys who works with Scotty Cameron on tour. He fits with the European tour guys for Scotty Cameron. And he simply will fit putters with using an iPad or iPhone, just videoing their stroke, understanding what the player's tendencies are. Can they aim the putter correctly? So if a player is struggling with aim, obviously something bigger with more lines or dots or whatever can help you with aim. If they don't like that because it looks too clumsy or it looks a bit busy and want something sleeker and there's more traditional shapes so I think one of the confusing ones from a coaching perspective you've got somebody like Jordan Speed who putts reverse grip but with a putter that's designed from face value to be quite a toe flowing putter mm. but he's putting very straight lines square faced so it's it's interesting I think putting again is it's I've always kind of seen it a bit like wine tasting. I know that's a silly thing to say, but go and have a look at what you like, narrow it down, and you'll find something that's just right. So you, there's such a selection. Try everything. You know, pick a putter up off the shelf. Does it look right? No. Discard it. What we're looking at is, is the length right? Does it sit on the floor correctly? Are you aiming it correctly and consistently? Does it feel good? Is the grip size comfortable? So there's so many more things that are, making you the artist that can can deliver good lines good start lines on a putt good distance control so yes it's performance but it, there's i think there's more artistry in putting it's would i be saying would i be right in saying it's a little bit more difficult for us at, at more part when we're fitting a putter 
to be able to experiment with the putters with different grip sizes because there are now so many different grip shapes sizes textures weights i mean it's <laughs> it's an endless, it's an endless list isn't it and i yeah. think i think the player often knows what they like mm -hmm. you know and it's it's a bit of a blind test you know what does this grip feel like too thick too thin too soft too firm so again a putter we might have something that's pretty standard in the lengths and the angles and the look but they might need something you know very preferential on a grip and that's something we can do no problem we can change grips uh, in the in the shop we do a lot of regripping um, and a lot of puttery gripping actually because it is it's a club you you're using a lot of the time yeah and and players on tour are i know for a fact of friends working on tour tracks are a nightmare with their putter grips <laughs> trying to get them out the bag and cut them off and put a fresh one on you know it's almost yeah you you get some daggers from the player what are you doing touching my putter because that's where yeah. they're making their money yeah i mean you know the old adage of drive for show putt for dough and then all the statistics came out well that's not strictly true you try taking a putter off of a player and you say i'll just change this grip for you there you've got no chance i mean if you go on the internet and actually do google either tiger woods's putter grip or Jordan Spieth's putter grip, yeah. they're pretty battered. They are uh, very torn, and it would be, you look at photographs with Tiger from late 90s to very recently, that, that putter grip hasn't really changed. He, mm. he knows what he likes. So the player will, will ask, you know, get me a supply, get me 100 grips, because I need them to last my career. You know, and God forbid that grip stops in production, because you, you just don't know what they'll be able, <laughs> what, what they'd end up doing. but. Yeah, it, it's the one club they, they seem very, very attached to. And a lot of manufacturers with the Tour Pros, you know, the, the, the deals that they do with the manufacturers often aren't actually 14 club deals. We all think of it as they've got to change everything. There is some leeway in there. Often it's a 10 club deal. because that player may have a putter that they've had from their junior days, their college days. They're just not going to part with. And I, 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 think, I think that shows you how attached they can be to a particular club. With with regards to um, what what we can do on site, yes, um, you you've obviously mentioned regripping. Is there anything else we that you guys can do on site? Yeah, I mean we can. I, I I'm quite handy in terms of reshafting and things if we absolutely have to. Um, we tend to. 99.9% .9 of the time, to be honest, we're going to send that club for reshaft back to the manufacturer because what they're going to be able to do is use their machines that they're calibrating their golf clubs with to send it back exactly how it was in the first place from a weight, a length perspective. And uh, basically, every brand has their own way of doing it. So you wouldn't want to kind of get your hands on a ping or a Callaway and, you know, disrupt the the ethos behind how that club has come come out in the first place. So we're we're very lucky that the, the manufacturers will pick them up and turn them around as quickly as they can and, and back back in their original condition. Um, if if it is by accident that club is is faulty, it is covered under a warranty. If you're somebody that's you know potentially put that club around your knee or <laughs> slammed it into the floor and it's broken, then obviously you voided the warranty. But we we can get that repaired, of course. Okay, so we essentially, if you need regrips, reglues, reglues, yeah, they, we can turn those around. They're, they're fairly simple. Um, if it is, if it's a new club, if it's a you know, if it's a set that I have fitted, mm -hmm. I might get the manufacturer involved because I I would want to make sure that's not going to happen to the rest of the set. Yeah, I can probably count on one hand how many times that's happened. In, in the years I've been here. So it's, it's a rarity with new stuff, but yeah, older clubs, 10, 15, 20 year old set of irons that, yeah, get knocked about, that you might get the head come off. Yeah, we'll, we'll re-glue that, get it back to you, make it secure. Um, do it, we can do it pretty quickly, if not on the day. Okay, so I've, I've got my new driver, my new um, fairway woods, got a couple of hybrids in there, irons, 
wedges, putter, all my bag set up and bits and pieces. And then um, you've got all the different types of bags, trolleys, bits and pieces, shoes, and, and all the, yeah. the, the kit and caboodle, Dave. How do, how do how the, the process of fitting between now, when we reopen, as in on the 29th and the 12th, is is going to be what and then going after the 12th how do people book in with you and jared and what costs are involved and all that sort of stuff so from from the 29th golf reopens um i'm actually back fitting from the 29th albeit it'll be outside because of the guidelines mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm intending to camp out in the practice nets by the studio uh, sorry by the chipping green uh not too far from the studio so we'll be fitting outside in a net which some people won't mind, some people will. We're still going to be using the GC quad. We're still going to use iPad for data. So you're going to get the same fit you would indoors with, with, with the screen behind me, just a slightly less exciting experience, but ultimately providing the same service. From the 12th, we'll be allowed back indoors. So I believe that the shop may reopen on the 12th, uh, but we'll be fitting back in here almost as normal. So... From the 12th onwards, it, it's a case of a member popping into the shop or, or calling the shop to inquire about fitting. But from the 29th, the best way of doing it is I either just phone the complete golfer. Um, Jared is splitting his time between here and there, so you'll get hold of him um, and he can get you booked in that way. If not, you, you, you'll probably see me in between fittings. It's going to be a busy, busy first week by the looks of my diary. Um, <laughs> As it was last time when we came back. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's there's multiple ways. You know, even you know, it, we've got a great relationship with the, with the other staff. So if you like yourself, if you bump into somebody, they're trying to get in contact with us. Uh, same as Matt, where's Amy? Anybody that's around, it's just yeah, just send the send their details to me, and I'll, I'll call as soon as I can. Okay, and the it, like, is it an hour for if I, if I need if I need just a driver? Is that an hour? Or it, up to an hour, you've got to remember you're hitting your 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 club that you hit the hardest over and over and over again, and that is quite tiring. So there's often a, a bit of a golden window for how long we can hit drivers for before we start getting bad data. Um, we don't tend to do too many full bag fits because again, it's hitting a lot of shots, and by doing it maybe in stages allows you to get used to that, that new set of irons before you have to worry about a new drive or worry about wedges. And sometimes by doing the irons, it will affect the decision we make in a few months or a year on what wedges we look at and what your longest iron is. Did you go up to five or four iron? What, what hybrid should we look at as the next club? So often we just do it in steps and, and an hour seems to be enough time. If somebody does want a full bag, we, you know, they're looking at changing everything. It, it might be a special occasion birthday, retirement, they're treating themselves. Um, yeah, we can accommodate it. We just extend the time on the day. Um, I would say usually there is a fitting fee. We, we do charge a fitting fee. Uh, it's £25 for the fitting. Um, the reason we do that is just to ward off, for want of a, a better, better phrase, people that are going to time waste and just hit, hit some drivers for fun because we do have a busy diary. We, we can get a few weeks in advance uh, booked up. And I wouldn't want to fill slots with, with people that aren't serious about their golf equipment. When I've got a queue of members that are waiting to get in the studio, itching to try a driver that they're, they're very serious about, know about, they've done their research and they're, they're looking to see that extra distance or, or consistency. And without the, the 25 you do have several days with the equipment manufacturers as well. We do. I mean, with the £25 fee as well, if, if you do go ahead and purchase anything, we knock that off the price. So it effectively is a free fitting. Um, but we do run demo days as well, which are free of charge. You just book in with us via the golf shop. So all the manufacturers will come down for the day, four or five hours. You can book a slot. So if somebody is particularly a fan of Mizuno, they want Mizuno and nothing else, they may come to the Mizuno demo day. Uh, albeit we have it in the studio here. So I've had the, the scenario where they've, they've gone to the demo day, had a great experience, and they might book a fitting with us almost just to double check, just to make sure, you know, that guy is only fitting Mizuno. He, he is, he's pushing me in one direction. They'll often come in and test that with me and then say, Dave, have I missed anything? Is there a brand? Is there a model or a shaft that 
I should be thinking about. And, and often those guys, they've done the perfect job. I might just offer a comparison with a couple of other brands and say, we're, we're pretty much in the ballpark with all of them. It's, it's a case of what fits your eye and what fits your budget. Perfect. And then does it matter? Do we do, do we do fittings for ladies? We do. Do we fit left-handers? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, know we, I know we have the ability to, you just have to switch the room around with a lead. We, we do. It, we're just limited by what the manufacturers will send us. Mm. So left-handed driver fairway hybrid fittings is almost, in, it's not possible. We're just not sent those components uh, by, by the manufacturers in our demo kits, which we invest in. So they kind of hold the key to what the menu is of what we get. Irons, yes, we, we get a selection of left-handed iron, iron heads. So it is something we work on every year, myself and the guys at Complete Gold, we try and come up with ways of, of incorporate, incorporating left-hand, but often that's where the demo day is the best place because mm -hmm. the manufacturer is bringing every left-handed head that they carry. Um, but we do fit ladies, yes. We've got a selection of, of shafts and heads that are, are, are lady specific, shall we say. So there are slightly different weights to, the, to them, slightly different lengths. So it's not a case of just getting a, a manufacturer's head that suits the men and putting a lady shaft in it. There are weighted ladies' heads specifically for that, that type of club head speed, albeit some of our, our lady members in, in their first team have you know, very good club head speeds. And some of those that I've fitted have actually ended up in men's equipment. And that, that's the thing with fitting. It's trying not to label a player and saying, you're, you're a female player, you need ladies equipment. Well, actually some of the men could benefit from ladies equipment as well, because it's lighter, it's more flexible. It offers them more ease of use. So it's trying not to pigeonhole yourself as a player. And we, like I said at the start, we just base it case by case. Come with an open mind and see, and what, let's see where we go with it. Yeah, let's see yeah. where we end up and hopefully we've improved. Yeah, I mean, I know that when we, when we get back to golf and I manage to get out on the course and, and play a few times, I know I've got to fill in the gap between my five iron and my beloved three wood. And that's a huge gap that we've got to fill with probably a couple of hybrids because although I'd like to say I can hit a four iron, I'm not sure I can anymore. <laughs> um, I definitely can't hit a three iron. And you don't really don't see many two and one irons anymore. But um, I think we've pretty much covered everything that yeah. I wanted to cover, David. Um, the the only other thing is there is slight differences between TrackMan and and the DC Quad, the launch monitors. Um, I know that you in in the in the swing studio you use um, GC Quad for fitting. You might see on the club faces with the dots. Um, now, the only difference, some people might say, the only, the only differences that we notice, would I be right in saying, is that club head speed sure. is, is different because the place where they take the club head speed reading from is different between GC Quad and Trackman. GC Quad takes it at the point of impact. Yeah, point of touch. Whereas Trackman takes it at the greatest point of compression, which can be about that much further into impact where the club head has slowed down due to the impact. Would that be That's correct? correct? That's correct. So often there's the, the phrase that people that are familiar with fitting and, and launch monitors is smash factor. So with GC Quad, we call it efficiency. It's the same measurement. You're, you're dividing uh, ball speed and club head speed. So for ease of conversation, I hit a driver with 150 ball speed. I swing at 100 miles an hour with the club. We divide those numbers and we get 1.5, 1.50. So if the club head is being measured at a different point, that could make that efficiency or smash factor 1.48 or 1.52. And... I'll have players that are very familiar that, you know, you teach on TrackMan. They come for their fitting and they say, Dave, my, my efficiency is terrible. And I'll say, well, it's not. It, it's just being measured differently. So it, it's, it's a case of, you know, you and I needing to know what's a good efficiency in a driver fitting and an iron fitting. What's a good efficiency in a golf lesson with an iron and a driver. 
depending on what device you're using. But I, I think it's great at Moore Park that we've got both. You know, we've got your, your new room, your swing suite with Trackman. We've got our fitting studio, um, as well as being used by the coaches for teaching with a GC quad. So if a player is more comfortable on one device, it's a bit like people are more comfortable on iPhone, iOS, or, or, or are they more, you know, the, the Samsung devices on iOS. So it, it, depending yeah. on what operating system you, you prefer, go with that. But yeah, in, in the room, we've got a slightly smaller room, so we, we can't put the track man as far away as we need to. Correct. So yeah. we've gone down the road of GC Quad, which a lot of the, the fitters worldwide are now switching between a bit of both, a bit of track man, a bit of quad. Uh, so it's very much a, a level playing field as I see it. Fantastic. David, I think I've covered everything I wanted to, to cover. I, can't, <laughs> I really look forward to seeing you on the 29th. I know we're going to be a bit like ships passing in the, well, in, well. on the sea. You know, I'll, see, I'll see you next week and I'll see you tonight and bits and pieces. But um, I really look forward to seeing you. Thanks for doing this. Hopefully no that's a lot of questions that the members would have about technology, um, how, clubs are, how clubs are fitted. There's, and I'm, I, like I said, I'll go all the way back to the start of this session. I've seen a lot of the best players in the world with their fitters from their companies and the service that yourself and Jared give in looking after the experience that you give through Complete Golfer at Moore Park is of that level. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, what I really like is that you're not biased. No. Um, you know, you may be... Uh, a brand ambassador for one, but that doesn't mean that everybody has to use that uh, that that equipment, which I think is fantastic. Um, I really enjoy watching you do fittings. So sometimes I will come and watch you do a fitting because I love watching experts and and specialists do what they do. And you know, we're I think we're very very lucky to have you at Moore Park, and I enjoy working with you a lot, David. So thanks very much for doing this. Likewise, Duncan. We'll. Uh,